Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we're here for another video dedicated to Warner Brothers because of its 100th anniversary this year and we are also going to talk about gangster movies. Definitely one of the top distinguishing marks of Warner Brothers. So in today's video we're going to take a look back at the genre a little bit more in depth and also the impact in film noir. This is a topic that has been covered many times but nevertheless this is quite a fascinating one and I wanted to also give my take on it, especially from the viewpoint also of film noir. It is probably necessary to remember that, as Orson Welles said, the classy gangster was a Hollywood invention. However, these characters represent key and iconic pieces of Hollywood history, of Hollywood cinema, and while they might not be a real depiction, as Welles so rightly remarks, they surely connected with audiences like few other characters did. The genre as such has its origins and starts to crystallize and be recognizable after the release of several important films, many of them produced by Warner Brothers. I'm talking about movies like Archie Mayo's The Doorway to Hell, released in 1930, and most famously Mervyn Leroy's Little Caesar, William Wellman's The Public Enemy, both released in 1931, and Howard Hogg's Scarface, released in 1932 and produced by Howard Hughes. So Warner Brothers, once again, like we mentioned, in my previous video was really embracing the changing times and ended up creating a legacy of unforgettable films that continue to inspire and captivate audiences to this day. But these gangster movies also have their predecessors. As many of you know, gangster films were really based on gangsterism and was subsequently depicted in silent films in the early 20th century. You can even take a look back at a film like The Great Train Robbery, released in 1903, and see an early depiction of gangsterism. However, a film like The Musketeers of Pig Alley, directed by David Work Griffith and released in 1912, is generally considered a much direct cinematic evidence of a certain formalization of a gangster movie. It was not at all the first gangster film ever made, but it is one that is able to materialize a certain initial depiction of what would later be the archetypical cinematic gangster persona, not only in terms of the nature of these characters themselves, but also because of the way the movie was filmed. Another interesting aspect of the film is also that it aimed at achieving some form of realism by having its outdoor scenes filmed at the Lower East Side of New York. In these early years of the 20th century, we might find several examples of these preliminary depictions of gangsterism in movies. We can talk about The Gangster and the Girl, released in 1914, Regeneration, or The Italian. Once again, all these films centering their action at the Lower East Side in New York. However, these initial visions of gangsterism in movies were presented with a package of a romantic plot of melodramatic nature that relegated the representation of gangsters and of violence to a marginal space. So unlike more recognizable approaches, these early films showed little insight of the intricacies of the criminal organization, its activities or its aspirations. It was not until the 1920s with the arrival of prohibition when gangsterism was defined as a criminal and commercial organization and consequently when cinema really began to produce films about its members. So between 1920 and 1927 a large number of films emerged introducing the figure of the gangster whose appearance and activities were viewed with certain sympathy and admiration by audiences. As it has been discussed and said before, these characters represented the gradual rise of the marginalized individuals in pursuit of economic and social glory in a capitalist society. So essentially, it was a culmination of the American dream, albeit the dark side of the American dream. Also in the 1920s, aside from prohibition, there was another factor that contributed to the configuration 
creation both stylistically and narratively of gangster movies, which was the creation of the pulp magazine The Black Mask, which coincided with the evolution and complexity achieved by the language of silent cinema that allowed for a consistent stylization such as that achieved by Joseph von Sternberg with Underworld, released in 1927, the film that was a real precursor to the gangster genre. This movie really lays the foundations of gangster mythology by showing us several tropes of gangster films, which would later seep into film noir, such as the mall, the femme fatale, or the gangster himself. Furthermore, also this film managed to establish really key stylistic patterns based on German expressionism that would impact film noir later. The advent of sound, which we covered in my last video, brought also many possibilities to really enhance the realistic aspect of the language of movies. In this regard, action-packed gangster films featuring thundering machine gun shots, car chases, etc. were really a temptation for any filmmaker eager for sound experimentation. In this light, we have to remember a movie that I mentioned in the previous video, which is The Lights of New York, released in 1928 by Warner Brothers, which was the first all-talking picture and, of course, the first sound gangster film, which, although it was not a super great movie, combined the dialogue with exciting, for the time, sound effects that, again, made all the difference for gangster films. During this period, we also have films like The Big City, also released in 1928, The Racket, Alibi, and Thunderbolt, both released in 1929. This last one, also by Von Sternberg, William Wallman's Chinatown Nights, or Born Reckless, released in 1930. These films were rehearsals in a way of all the new techniques brought by sound, together again, as I said, with a substantial increase in the narrative importance of the criminal plot, not just as a collateral subplot, but becoming more and more the focus of the story. All of these pictures also deal in different ways with the struggles between different gangs and the pain and misery experienced by their characters. So as you can see, also the focus was shifting. Also with the full emergence of sound in movies, this allowed for new plots, for stories in which dialogue and sound would play obviously a more prominent role. This era also coincided with the period in which the big names of real gangsterism began to occupy newspaper pages and to generate consequently a progressive and widespread curiosity towards the affairs of these individuals. This curiosity was further provoked by criminal stories published again in pulp magazines, comics of the time, and films themselves further extended the shadow of their impact. Names like Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, John Dillinger became inspiration for fiction. The Great Depression that took place after the crack of 1929 also heavily impacted this period. As you can imagine, it was the time when the most radical gangster movies appeared at that time, such as, again, Little Caesar, The Public Enemy, or Scarface. But although all these films were box office successes, once again, Warner Bros. took a risk with a film like Little Caesar, based off a novel by William Riley Burnett, a novelist and screenwriter whom I mentioned before in videos dedicated to film noir because of his contribution either by writing the original material or the screenplay with films like High Sierra, This Gun for Hire, The Asphalt Jungle, or The Racket. But as I was saying, Warner Brothers took a risk with Little Caesar because at the time what most studios were producing were escapism pieces. The movie, as Mervyn Leroy recalls in his autobiography, is a tale told again the background of the Chicago mobs and it is focused on one supremely, in his words, egotistical mobster called Cesar Enrico Bandello. Oh, little Caesar, huh? Yeah, sure. Perhaps in its own way, it went too far in the other direction, that of escapism, and was something of an exaggeration, which would be in the vein of what Orson Welles said about classy gangsters. But Little Caesar became a tremendous hit, both with the critics and moviegoers, so it is clear that they really hit on something big. After Little Caesar came again The Public Enemy, directed by William Wellman, responsible for making James Cagney a star, also at the recommendation of Wellman himself. Bill is not only imaginative, he's also unorthodox. 
I was not supposed to play the uh, first hoodlum in the picture. The parts were switched. And uh, as I remember it, as I got the story, Bill made quite an issue of it. And that was the first break. And Bill, I'll always be great. And a year later, as I said before, Howard Hawks Scarface, which was produced independently by Howard Hughes. The plot for this movie is similar to the previous ones in the sense that it depicted the rise and fall of this gangster figure, of this gangster character. In this case, Tony Camonte, played by Paul Muni, a boastful individual in need of affection and public recognition. In all these films, excessive ambition was always the downfall for this character. However, Howard Hawks presents a vision of the gangster that is more childish and he strips the character of a previous more romantic representation as an anti-hero. All these three movies, tremendous and iconic examples of the genre. There are many elements in all these films also and is something that we'll see in later depictions of the gangster that almost reaches Shakespearean dimensions in terms of the tragedy that surrounds this character the relationships that surround these characters which is really really interesting once more as cinema is an ever-changing art there was yet another factor that impacted the genre substantially which was the enforcement of the production code in 1934 this new self-censorship played a significant number obviously on the production of gangster movies that meant that violence criminals the vision offered by these movies, sex was no longer deemed acceptable for audiences and therefore censored. One of the most visible examples of that is that by 1935, Warner Brothers released a movie like G-Man in which James Cagney would now go on to play a lawyer to chase now the criminals. Another paradigmatic case of that for Warner Brothers as well was the movie Bullets or Ballads released in 1936 and starring Edward G. Robinson this time playing a police detective who goes undercover and joins a New York racket. The film also shows an effort to curb the violence shown in this films in subsequent portrayals of gangsters in movies there would be an exploration of the causes for this criminal behavior which would be in the environment as it is the case in movies like Angels with Dirty Faces also starring James Cagney, Pat O'Brien, Humphrey Bogart and Anne Sheridan and released in 1938. Something also portrayed in William Wyler's Dead End with Humphrey Bogart again, Sylvia Sidney or Joel McRae. From this moment on, gangster films throughout mid-1930s and early 40s can be really classified according to the actor who starred in them. And Warner Bros, of course, was the gangster studio par excellence, with several actors that, as we know, established their careers by playing these tough guys, including, as I mentioned before, Edward G. Robinson, James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, also later on John Garfield, or even even Spencer Tracy but other actors who also contributed a lot to gangster films were George Raft or Paul Muni. In the 1940s, gangster movies lost relevance and lost interest for the public. As audiences were experiencing World War II, it was then the birth of film noir, which eclipsed or rather swallowed the gangster genre for a while. Also, the death of the main real-life figures also were detrimental in audiences losing interest interest for the genre. Consequently, also because of the constrictions of the production code, the films began to yield the spotlight towards private detectives and other types of criminals more in line with the reality of the decade. Nevertheless, the aesthetics, the stylization that was introduced by gangster movies, again by films dating back from underworld. Film noir absorbed after World War II, the hierarchy within criminal organization became more and more complex and such portrayals can be seen through two Kirk Douglas performances playing gangster archetypes in films such as Out of the Past or I Walk Alone. Also, the much publicized investigation into organized crime in the early 1950s led to the appearance again of organized 
crime in movies that would now also expose its power to also reach into public institutions. That can be seen in movies such as The Enforcer, The Turning Point, New York Confidential, or Slightly Scarlet. In this era, we see other new depictions of the gangster played by actors like Richard Conte, Robert Ryan, or Raymond Burr. So again, the genre as it had existed during the 1930s fade out and its characters were largely absorbed by film noir. James Cagney would also reprise his iconic gangster persona perhaps with one of his best performances in White Heat or the sublime Key Largo in which Edward G. Robinson in this case played a gangster who was now seen by the end of the 1940s as a relic of the past. In subsequent decades though it was revived periodically in different forms also being spoofed or parodied in several movies but it has never lost its power again to entice and to connect with audiences so as I said at the beginning of this video the shadow of gangster films is a long one and that is one of the reasons why this topic then is so fascinating and so massive to cover in just one video but I hope in any case that this was a somewhat comprehensive view on the genre ranging from the silent era up until the 1950s there is obviously more to it but I'm going to end up the video here and I hope as always that you enjoyed it as always thank you so so much for your support and for your love for classic films I would love to know what your favorite gangster films are and once again take care stay safe and see you all soon with another video bye